McAllen's 1938 single malt Scotch whiskey is rare. From the moment it was extracted from the barley of the Scottish countryside to the moment it was bottled and distributed for the world to enjoy, it's hard fought and won battle from politics and wartime restrictions to bombs to the fickle tastes of the 1980s grants this bottle relic status. Not even James Bond himself could conquer the bottle so keen on seeing its contents grace the lips of Scotch enthusiasts who struggle to put its beauty into words. Is the Macallan 38 giving Braveheart vibes? Yes, it kind of is. They may take our lives, but they'll never take our whiskey. As if the 1938 had a scamp-like survival written into its DNA, the history of Scotch itself is one of muddy details and tax evasion. Scotch whiskey has been produced in Scotland as early as the 15th century, with an entry in tax records reading, eight bowls of malt to Friar John Corr, wherewith to make aqua vitae. While Friar John Corr was seemingly producing his whiskey above board, illicit Scotch production was rampant for several hundred years, with about half the whiskey consumed in Scotland being illegal and untaxed. This is crying, which any fool can eat but for which the Lord intended a more divine means of consumption. The origins of Macallan likely fell into this undocumented category. While rumors that an illicit distillery had been operating where Macallan now stands since the 1700s, the world-famous distillery we know today was founded by Alexander Reed, a barley farmer as the Elkies Distillery. Barley farming lent itself very easily to distilling. During winter months when farming came to a halt, surplus barley would be fermented and the cold water of winter would cool the stills in production. Reed's operation was a success. In 1880, phylloxera devastated European vineyards and wine production suffered. Scotch whiskey distillers capitalized on this moment and scotch quickly became the most enjoyed spirit in Europe. It even survived the US's prohibition, being granted an exception as doctors often prescribed whiskey to patients. In these boon years, Kemp had the forethought to set up a trust, ensuring the distillery would remain in the hands of his family members, which it did until 1997. With World War II looming, the relatively small distillery was under the operation of Dr. Samuel Allen Sheik. The distillery was in the business of producing single malt whiskeys to sell to other whiskey makers for their blends. Still, they had a mind toward high quality, well-aged whiskeys and had a good reputation among their buyers. The 1938 was distilled and cast in the nick of time, as the declaration of World War II in 1939 brought an onslaught of production restrictions. In the following years, Scotland went from producing 10.7 million proof gallons per year to only 3.2 in the first year of the war, and endured an even slimmer allowance in the years that followed, only producing 3.7 million proof gallons for the entirety of the remaining war years. The barley necessary for production was redirected to help feed the citizens of Scotland. By 1944, hardly any Scotch whiskey was being produced at all, unless it was done illicitly. Distillers were in a difficult spot. They could either compromise quality by bottling significant significantly younger whiskies or sell through aged stock, possibly compromising the longevity of their business. But Macallan, which was a much smaller production at the time, refused to compromise their quality and likewise refused to sell their aged stock, a choice that made the 38 what it is today. Aside from navigating the legal landmines of wartime whiskey production, Macallan had to dodge a far more literal danger, bombs. Scotland was not spared the wreckage of the war, and it's estimated that 4.7 million proof gallons of Scotch whiskey were lost due to air bombings. That's more than was successfully produced for much of the war. In the early half of the 20th century, Vodka was often considered the choice of excessive drinkers, as it was odorless and inexpensive. But beginning in the 1950s, entertainment seemed to go hand in hand with cocktail making, and a particular drink was taking the world by storm, the Moscow Mule. Smirnoff was the first to capitalize on the cocktail, mixing their vodka with ginger beer. The light and refreshing libation won the hearts of home entertainers. This would kick off a decades-long infatuation with party cocktails, which ranged from the simpler vodka mixes to novelty and dessert cocktails like the grasshopper to bright and juicy tiki drinks. The colorless and odorless spirit lent itself to a creativity in home entertaining that was a signature of the era, giving birth to a number of classic mixes we still know today, as well as lost-to-time stomach-turning concoctions such as the Bullshot, a now puzzling mix of vodka and warm beef broth. In 1964, James Bond first uttered the words, Mom. Martini, shaken, not stirred. The film was Goldfinger, and after recouping its $3 million production cost in a matter of weeks, it went on to become a global sensation. The famous line, as well as Bond's cool persona, high-class happy hours with supervillains, and a collection of impressive gadgets, became iconic. This would set off a pop culture infatuation for clear liquor that superseded the quieter trends in home entertaining. In 1950, only 40,000 cases of vodka were sold in the U.S. By the time James Bond hit the scene, sales were upwards of 4 million. By the 1970s, vodka was the highest selling spirit in the United States. 
Smirnov even conquered vodka's obvious connotation to Soviet Russia in the Cold War era by aligning tightly with the Bond franchise, identifying as strongly as possible with the Brit who fights Russian bad guys, and Americans, for the large part, were amicably blinded and happy to partake. In 1981, the same year the 1938 Macallan was bottled, Andy Warhol designed an advertisement for Absolute Vodka, further endearing vodka to spirits drinkers and signifying its pinnacle of popularity. Vodka cocktails like the Espresso Martini and the Cosmopolitan were developed. Party shots were all the rage, many of which made use of the clear liquor that packed a punch, and the diet-focused masses of the 80s embraced a lighter-tasting liquor that blended easily with seltzer and diet sodas for a relatively low-calorie option. A dark liquor, drunk straight, was in notion relegated to old men. With a shrinking demand, the enormous surplus stock of blended scotch whiskey, or whiskey lock, sent producers into a tailspin, nearly destroying the industry entirely, and causing more than a dozen scotch distillers to shutter their business. And yet, Macallan turned its eye toward its quiet, long-suffering cask of 1938 and saw a glimmer of hope. With scotch blends on the brink of death globally, a fledgling interest in single malt whiskeys by connoisseurs led Macallan to refocus. They had announced their single malt label back in 1966, and in the early 80s, under the operation of Alan Sheik, grandson of the operator that originally saw the 1938 distilled and cast, managed to drum up interest in a handful of special bottlings. A decade after the 38's release, Sheik would leave Macallan and eventually co-create the Netflix hit The Queen's Gambit, as well as a healthy list of other well-known film and TV projects. After Macallan miraculously sidestepped the whiskey lock that claimed many of its comrades, the producer's reputation as an exceptional single malt scotch producer grew. As for the 1938, it doesn't come up at auction very often. Originally retailing between $30 and $40, its value has skyrocketed. The scotch has garnered some of the highest scores for single malt whiskey, and some consider it to be the best Macallan of all time. Upon tasting it, respected taster Sergei of Whiskey Fun poured over its characteristics, listing blooming flavor after blooming flavor before ironically stating that it leaves him speechless. Considering its harrowing journey from its birth in a modest Speyside still, to dodging pitfall after pitfall of the Second World War, to its preservation during decades of industry growth, all to make another narrow escape at the whim of the changing tastes of spirits drinkers in the booming era of vodka, the bottle wears its handwritten label and red ribbon as a uniform steeped in honor. 